Well, thank you for joining me on the Waters and Stanton video channel. I'm uh, in the local woods again on a short woodland walk, and I thought we'd talk about exploring the HF bands, the dead HF bands. Can we put some life into these HF bands? Are they really dead? Can we sort of make a little adventure in exploring these bands and uh, have some fun and also learn a few things in the process. So let's let's take a look at um, exploring these HF bands. Now, recent times, last few weeks actually, there's been a number of comments about the condition on the HF bands. We've uh, recently passed the sunspot maximum and there were some great conditions then. But sometimes after the sunspot maximum it feels as if you've fallen off the edge of a cliff. 10 metres is no longer open every day, 12 metres similar. And generally speaking conditions have been somewhat poor. In fact I think newcomers would say it's been alarming because they're so used to having the bands open for a good few hours each day and uh, say things like 10 meters where you can work the world on a few watts and a very simple aerial those days seem to have gone well i think they probably will come back in the autumn of this year uh, time will tell but nevertheless it is alarming now very often you switch on the radio and you'll find that uh, perhaps the band is dead, 10 metres is dead, 12 metres seem to be dead. There's not much on 21 megahertz, 15 metres. And it's all very disappointing. But you know, sometimes the bands are dead. Not because propagation is not there, but because stations aren't on the air. And you need to differentiate between a band that's dead because there's no propagation and the band is dead because there's no stations on. And there's a danger in these sort of conditions of uh, everybody listening but nobody transmitting. And if you're in that sort of situation, what actually happens is that the band appears to be dead because nobody bothered to call CQ because the band is dead. Perhaps that's uh, a bit of an exaggeration, but I think you get the, the drift of what, of what I'm saying. So let's take a look at the ways perhaps you can explore the ham radio bands and have some fun. Now there is a system of beacons which I think a lot of people don't realise. On the HF bands, from 20 metres through to 10 metres, there's a series of HF beacons which are on 24 hours a day. And it goes round in a, a, approximately a three minute cycle. These beacons are situated around the world and they transmit on a particular frequency. For example, on 20 metres, uh, it's 14.1 megahertz. And these beacons, as I say, transmit 24 hours a day. But they transmit uh, in a cycle. So no, no beacon is transmitted at the same time as another one. And uh, each beacon transmits for approximately 10 seconds. Now the interesting part about this is that the beacons not only transmit for 10 seconds, but they transmit at power levels starting at 100 watts and going down to uh, 100 milliwatts. So not only are you able to see whether there's any propagation, but sometimes by look, looking, listening to the power levels, gauging how good the propagation is. If you can only just hear the signal when it starts up, when it's 100 watts, then obviously there's propagation there, but it's not wonderful. 
But if you can follow that signal right down to 100 milliwatts, then propagation is pretty good. Now this particular network is very good for shortwave listeners because all you need to do is to switch on your receiver and listen. And the other good thing about it is it's live. You've got a live report on the conditions at uh, any particular time. Now I've got up on the screen here the HF beacon network and it actually shows you which beacon is transmitted at any one time, the frequency and the location. And I'm going to show you just before Finland comes up on the screen. You'll see Finland come up, you'll hear the call sign. Um, band conditions are pretty awful. I think the next one is Madeira. Um, which is pretty pretty uh, pretty weak but anyway you'll get the idea you'll hear the 100 watts goes down to 100 million watts uh, Finland and then you'll see Finland change from Madeira on the screen and you'll hear just about hear it but it's, it's very weak just shows you how bad conditions are at the moment Now, there's another way of checking conditions, which again is live, and again it's quite an interesting um, test that you can make. It's called the Reverse Beacon Network, and I've covered this. Um, oh, by the way, <clears throat> if you want more details of the uh, HF um, Beacon Network, then just type in Ham Radio HF Beacon Network. Uh, in Google and that will come full details of uh, the various stations um, around the world and uh, the time and so forth. Right, so there's another network that you can use which um, is good fun but it does mean to say you've got to transmit a signal. That's the um, reverse beacon network and if you want to get into it just type in in Google reverse beacon DX and you need first of all to put your call sign in and then you need to actually transmit a signal and you can transmit either test followed by your call sign or cq 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 followed by your call sign if you send cq of course you've got to be prepared for a reply so if you're not um, proficient at uh, cw best thing to do is to put test test and then your call sign g3o jv or whatever your call sign happens to be. Here you see I've logged on to reverse beacon DX and I enter my call sign G3OJV and then I press return and that brings up the map. And now I'm calling CQ and in a minute you'll see the return um, on the map that shows the beacons that have spotted me. There we are. That's the first uh, return. There is a delay for the uh, final outcome. There we are, that's the final outcome now. You can see that that was running 50 watts um, into an in-fed half wave and uh, it's not too bad at the middle of the day on 20 metres. So you can see how useful it is. Now the good thing about this um, network is that you get an instant report from all over the world of the fact that your signal has been heard and also the signal strength above the local noise level. And if you're on 20 metres during the day, you'll probably get reports up to around about a thousand miles or so. If the band conditions are really good, of course, it'll be further. But the whole uh, idea of this is that once again, you get an instant report of band conditions. But in this case, you actually know that your signal is being heard at a far point and at what signal strength. So, two systems which are live, which are very easy to use. Now, there is a third way of checking band conditions, which I think is a very, very useful tool to uh, use. And that is using the digital network or the digital channels. 
Uh, FT8 is the sort of generic general, uh, general mode for um, digital communication. Um, there's various forms, but anyway, we'll call it FT8. And the big advantage of FT8 is that it's all centered on a very narrow frequency band. So in other words, all operators that are on the air on that particular band are going to congregate in a very narrow bandwidth of just a couple of kilohertz wide. That means to say that if there's any activity on the band, it will take place on that very narrow network of frequencies. And uh, if you go onto Google again and put in FT8 um, channels, you'll come up with all the various channels in each, each, um, each band. It's all about noise. Uh, they're in the woods, it doesn't stop an aircraft flying over. So the big advantage of FT8 is that if there's any activity on the band, and if the band is open, you'll almost certainly hear the signals because a lot of FT8 operators will be putting out calls all the time to try and make contact with other stations. Now you don't need to be able to decode the FT8. It'd be rather nice if you could because you'd know what you're listening to, but you don't need to decode it. You just need to use it as a marker as to whether there's any propagation or not. I often uh, check 10 metres, you know. And it's a quite surprising when 10 metres is absolutely dead. Until you go down to the FT8 channel and you hear these signals. So if you detect some FT8 signals, it's well worth putting out a uh, CQ call and uh, probably several CQ calls to see if you can get a reply because it does prove that the uh, band is open. And here's some FT8 on 10 metres, no sign of any SSB signals but uh, clearly some FT8 activity and I've no doubt that uh, it would support SSB as well. Oh, nice seat to sit down on. So you see there are some ways and means that you can use in order to determine if the band is actually open. Well, I think it's quite, uh, it's quite an adventure actually. If the bands seem pretty quiet, it's quite an adventure just to double check and see if perhaps you can open the band. You find that there is some propagation there and uh, you put out a couple of CQs and you get a response. You may have to put out several CQs because other people will have taken the same view that the band is dead because there's no signals. The reason there's no signals is because nobody's transmitting. And that does happen quite a bit when bands are uh, pretty pretty poor so it's worth uh, it's worth looking at so we've looked at three ways of checking band conditions you can use the HF beacon network which covers 20 through to 10 meters you can use the reverse beacon network which covers 80 meters through to uh, 6 meters I think it's 6 meters or you can use FT8 and see if you can hear any signals on what is otherwise a dead band. And as I say, 10 metres is a prime example. There's often propagation on 10 metres that uh, you may not realise when you tune across the band. There we are. As usual, thank you for your support on this channel. It's much appreciated. And also thank you for your support uh, the shop and on the website. Uh, by the way, um, I think the, at long last the FTX transceivers uh, are about to arrive. Uh, the FTX um, One Field and the FTX Optima. Um, if you're interested in one of those, um, then please give us a ring. Um, I'm told that we have good supplies of stock. Um, we purposely didn't take any deposits in advance because, as you now see, the uh, transceiver didn't uh, manifest itself um, in March or April, as was expected. And that could be very frustrating if you put a deposit on it and then you still haven't got your transceiver. Um, and I think that uh, that may have caused one or two problems. 
uh, with other retail outlets. So we chose not to accept deposits. We take names, but not deposits, because we wanted to um, make sure that uh, if you change your mind because you've waited so long, then there wouldn't be any embarrassment there. So if you're interested in the FTX field or the Optima, uh, I'm told we'll have good stock. I think it's just about to arrive. Give us a call. And if you've got a part exchange deal you want to do, well, obviously we can do that over the phone. A usual, usual method then is that uh, we can we will charge you the price for the FTX, send it out to you, um, collect your second-hand item. If it's as you described, then we will then give you a refund on your credit card to the value of the gear that we're taking into in part exchange. And of course, um, at the end of the month when you pay your bill, you, all you'll pay is the net amount. So uh, that's quite a handy system. So thanks for the support on this channel. I much appreciate it. You take care. And as usual, I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye for now.